Okay, welcome to the session on uh, local uh, on district advocacy. Uh, Jerry Letterer is a counselor with Best Best and Krieger. They're a uh, law firm out of D.C. that uh, specializes in that his he specializes in municipal and redevelopment law. Uh, a lot of you may know Jerry. Uh, he's been around and a friend of the Alliance for quite a while. He was formerly with Miller Van Eaton, and uh, when they uh, merged with Best Best Krieger, he went along with them, and he's been doing some knockout work. Jerry also serves as the Legislative Council for the Telecommunity, T-E-L-Com, Unity, a collection of local governments dedicated to ensuring respect for local rights. Today he's going to talk to us, as I said, about uh, how to interact with uh, your local representatives, both national and federal, your reps and senators, and how to do this when they're in town, when they're in your local community. So Jerry, take it away. Thanks, Ralph. <clears throat> and hello, everyone. Uh, I hope this works. Uh, I want to thank my colleague, Tom Melendrez, uh, who's out. Tom, you're in Riverside or in San Diego, but uh, he's, he's out in California. I'm actually at this very moment in Orlando, Florida, where I'm uh, presenting uh, to the conference of mayors, and, uh, and I do need to apologize publicly to Ralph. Um, I, I had my weeks mixed up, and I think that Ralph, quite honestly, when I told him that, didn't think that anyone could be that dumb. Uh, <laughs> but I proved this week that I could be even dumber uh, because I always assumed that Ann Arbor was in the central time zone. So I've been telling Tom Melendrez for the last week that I need to do a WebEx meeting at 1.30 Eastern, 2.30 Central, and, and 4.30 his time. And we're out very politely on about four different occasions trying to hint to me know that it was 1.30 for him as well. So uh, uh, sorry about that. Um, the only other thing I, I, I would do is, if I could, not necessarily correct, but maybe amend uh, Ralph's uh, presentation or description of the program. I really hope that I'm not presenting. Uh, I, I hope that I'm having a dialogue. Uh, you've got some real pros. Ralph is a pro. Deb is a pro. Uh, there are a number of other folks from Michigan that have the, the battle scars talk about these things. And, and so I, I don't want to come in as the guy over the internet or the guy from Washington that's going to present what, how, how all these things work. Uh, I would like to have a conversation because I learn as much from these things I hope it is I, I give or I probably learn more. So with that sort of in mind, what I've titled the presentation is, well, where does the alliance Agenda stand at the present time. Uh, what can and should be doing to assist that move forward by making the most of your advocacy visits, and that advocacy visit not only in Washington, but uh, but there, in the state capital, and city hall, and, and the county uh, commissioners, uh, because uh, if if Peg is to survive, and it's, you know. Most particularly, if the P channel is to survive, uh, we all have to devote as much advocacy to the preservation of our own operations as most of you devote on a daily basis to other very worthy causes. And you also need to reach out to all those folks uh, that have that have used or employed that used the kind of pejorative connotation to it but that have employed uh, public education government panels to move their message. Uh, if every one of those folks don't understand that PEG is very much under threat, uh, and, and we're, we're, we're missing a vital uh, component of our advocacy program. So sort of with that in mind, uh, there's my ugly mug in case the video didn't come through. Uh, so, what are we going to do today? I think the first thing we want to do is we 
do want to remind everyone, whether it be uh, you know, ACN Central or North Central or, or ACN National, uh, you're not alone. One of the core missions of the Alliance is to make sure that everyone knows that you're not alone. You know, there are friends out there uh, to help you, whether it be on an advocacy front, a technology front, programming front, or, you know, for a great many of you, uh, with personnel challenges with the, with the volunteers or for your paid staff. Um, the Alliance is there for you, and you should use it uh, for all of those things. And in particular, I really would recommend uh, good for you all for attending the regional meeting, and if the opportunity arises, the budget is supported. I really think I've been able to take a peek at the program that ACM has lined up for Chicago, and I think all of these things will come to you. All these rewards will come to you in the states uh, if you show up there. So uh, I think the most important message I can deliver today: you're not alone. The alliance is here to help. The second one. Um, is that you can be an advocate. Uh, a great many of you, either individually or have heard from your, your boards, that you know what, we're a nonprofit, and because of that, we're not allowed to be involved in advocacy. And that's not true. And we'll go through that a little bit, um, and we will be some sites that you can go to so that if you have a board member, uh, or, you know, quite honestly, sometimes our opponents We'll reach out to our board members and rather taking us rather than taking us on on the issues, what they will do is they will try to uh, undercut us by talking uh, procedure uh, and sometimes they don't exactly come through. And then we'll talk about some effective advocacy step by step ideas. And again, they're just ideas, they're not rules. Uh, there are people here on this in that room that, that do it as well, if not better than I do, maybe folks can, can help us out. And then we'll give you, obviously, an update on what the CAP Act does, and, and we'll open the floor up. So let's get started. Again, you're not alone. If you go to the Alliance's web page, you will find a copy of the CAP Act. You'll find that there's a model letter there to help you to request co-sponsorship. There is a detailed summary of the CAP Act. There's a sample letter that you can send to the FCC to call upon them now 375 years later to act on the ACM division, but it is still out there. Um, and it's all there. So again, you're not, you're not alone and you don't have to recreate the wheel. So what is the agenda right now for us? But uh, well, on the Hill, obviously, we continue to seek to uh, obtain co-sponsors House, uh, and we need a champion in the Senate. Now, we may be growing a champion in the Senate because, as hopefully you all know, your neighbor in Wisconsin, uh, Representative Baldwin, was successful in obtaining a Democratic nomination to be uh, that state senator. Uh, she's got a tough road ahead of her, uh, but, uh, but the polls uh, make it competitive. So, suppose maybe we'll have champion uh, elected to the Senate, uh, but I think we're kind of disappointed that we had people in the Senate that should have been our champion but haven't been our champion. Um, one of the most interesting one of all was Senator Brown from uh, Massachusetts, as opposed to Sherry Brown from Ohio, although Sherry Brown should be a champion as well, oh, but uh, Senator Brown from, from Massachusetts, despite being a Republican, uh, was a long-time uh, a peg a participant, uh, had a peg show, uh, and uh, quite disappointed when he didn't embrace um, the, the CAP Act. One of the, I think, our, our greatest challenges was uh, being from Massachusetts where uh, peg is pretty protected. He didn't, as he and his staff just didn't understand Brett, didn't want to be in a position to take on uh, their fellow, his fellow Republicans. But again, our, our, our mission is to educate Congress on the challenges facing the public education programming community. It seems, unfortunately, that the only the PEG can use that up for P uh, for a great, great majority.
already were, and it's our, our P advocates. Now that's not saying it's total. I mean, we've got people like Dent that are that are government and, and public. Um, we've got uh, we've got some some education advocates. Uh, but but I think we need to be honest. Uh, and Ralph, you know, another government. Uh, for the most part, most of the folks doing this are are, are to preserve the fee. Um, and that's a little disappointing that we don't have as much support from from the EMG as we do from the fee. But, uh, but we'll take it where we get it and we'll keep moving forward. Uh, the other is, is to pressure the FCC to act on the ACM petition. The ACM petition, again, to put it in, in very simplistic terms, is to challenge that uh, what AT&T is doing with Channel 99 is to challenge that, that whether or not that is in fact compliant uh, with the law or what they have to provide us under the Cable Act. Uh, Tim Lake uh, and, uh, and Jim Borwood have been the Alliance's counsel on the type petition, uh, and, and the Alliance could have been quite a bit. Two fine, fine lawyers, terrific lawyering. Um, so the fact that the, the fact that the petition has not moved is probably a, a reflection of their terrific lawyer. Because um, I think that, uh, I think there are those the commission that would like to dismiss it, but they know they really can't, but the lawyering was so well done. Uh, but keep being told that there are those the commission that feel that if they were to grant the ACM petition, at and would use that as an excuse to get out of the business or uh, actually challenge whether or not they're even a cable operator. Uh, and if they're not a cable operator, then they don't even provide uh, bank capacity. We're, we've got, uh, and, and as I mentioned, at, at, the, at the FCC, we're, we're now 41 months in count. That's how long our petition has been pending there. And then finally, we still see legislation pop up from time to time in the individual states. Uh, you'll see that Idaho there is highlighted in red because Idaho was a loss. And I'll go through what's happening in the state in a bit more detail uh, later in the presentation. So let's get into it, right? Uh, I'm a nonprofit. I can't be an advocate. Well, no, you can't. Uh, again, Deb and Ralph, you'll have to help me here since I don't have eyes and, and I guess we don't have a webcam there. Um, just, just from a show of hands, uh, are, are, has anyone ever been told that you cannot participate in any advocacy efforts because you're a tax exempt entity? Um, getting all no's. Shaking heads, I'll say no. Good. Well, that's good. Then we'll go through this quickly. Uh, because you can share it with others. Uh, in fact, there, there are a number of times people have said that. The answer is there are limitations by uh, nonprofits and government employees. Uh, but the rule is, is that you have a right, why did someone even say a responsibility to advocate uh, for the communities that you serve and to engage public policy process? And that comes right from the National Council. Of nonprofit associations. And the rules are, again, that if your charity, if you're a 501c3, um, you know, you can simply file a form that outlines of what you're doing, and as long as it doesn't rise to a certain threshold, and that threshold is about 20% of, of, your, of your funds uh, or a, a million dollars. Um, then you can show that you are not so, that you are not in a substantial part participating in, in advocacy. So again, if, if you hear anybody if that ever comes up, if any of your colleagues ever say that they can't participate uh, because they're a nonprofit, uh, know that you can go to the alliance and we've got uh, about a 12 slide presentation with cite to the to the IRS rules, etc. Uh, that will, in fact, address that. Okay, so we know that everybody can participate. We're increasingly seeing that there's a need to. But what is it that the CAP Act does? How does it go about doing it? Well, the CAP Act, is, so first of all, I should have mentioned before, is H.R. 1746. And one of the problems that we've been told by the Alliance, or the Alliance membership is that the Cable Act unnecessarily limits the use 
mistake was. If you look at the statute, what the statute says is that peg dollars that are used uh, for capital formation don't constitute a, any part of the franchise fee. That has been read or misread over the years to say that you can only use peg dollars for capital. Well, that's not true. You can use peg for operating if the company agrees to it. Uh, and, you know, traditionally a lot of people did use it. But what the bill does is it takes away that ambiguity. The bill amends the act to ensure that peg fees can be used for any peg purpose. That is, you can spend them on operating as well as capital. And if you were to pull up a copy of the Peg Act, HR 1746, you would you would not really you would say, Jerry, where's where's this section about the operating versus capital? And you would you would probably find it uh, hard to find um, if if you didn't know what you were looking for, because what we simply do is we eliminate or delete the limitation to capital so that if the funds that are that are provided the purposes of pay are over and above uh, the franchise fee. Second problem that we were told is that there is discriminatory treatment of pay channels. And, and, that, and that discriminatory treatment comes one of two ways. Uh, the, the first way is, is the traditional or the, the well known AT&T Channel 99. And, and that would, uh, um, the Channel 99 would reducing us from being a channel to really a web stream. And then the other is uh, that they put us on a tier or a portion of uh, their, their, their programming that requires you to have a digital box uh, for our programming. And that's the, that was the issue in Michigan with Comcast where Deb Guthrie uh, and her community were such great champions in fighting back. So what the CAP Act does CAP Act amends the Act to ensure that PEG programming must be transmitted without one, any material degradation, without altering or removing content or data, i.e. that's the channel 99, and that such signals shall be viewable by every subscriber of the cable system without additional service or equipment charges. Again, that's the Moving us up to a digital tier on the, the rest of uh, the rest of the tier on analog, and our people have to get it. And then finally, there can't be any fee for connection, and that's another part of the AT&T problem, where they have to charge people uh, for either the converter or for the connection. So that's again. So what what does the CAP Act do? What we've learned so far is it takes and makes all funding. A four pegs available for both operation and for capital. In a state like Michigan, that's important, where you have a pretty good percentage set aside under the state franchise law of four peg that would give you great flexibility in using those funds. Second thing that it does is it eliminates.